Welcome to Unrestrained, the podcast series from CPI. Here you can enjoy conversations where professionals on all sides of crisis and behavior management relax and open up about themselves, their workplace, and their clients. You'll get the latest tips and trends from the best in the business, so tune in often to integrate their experiences with your own. Hello and welcome to Unrestrained, the CPI podcast series. This is your host, Terry Vitona. Today I'm joined by Diana Graver. Hello and welcome, Diana. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. Diana is a recognized expert on digital literacy. She writes for and appears often in the press on topics related to how technology impacts human behavior, including guest blogs for CPI. Her no-nonsense approach comes from being an educator, media producer, academic, and most of all, a mom. Diana is a former adjunct faculty member of the Media Psychology MA program at the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology, where she taught media psychology for the 21st century. She also developed and teaches a middle school media literacy program called Cyber Civics. Today we're going to talk with Diana about Cyber Civics and how it can help kids learn about digital citizenship and online safety and how parents and educators can help kids embrace technology safely and wisely. We're also going to talk about a sister website of Diana's, CyberWise, whose motto is No Grown Up Left Behind. All right, Diana, could we begin today by having you give our listeners an overview of how and why you started CyberWise, the meaning of your motto, and the concept of digital citizenship as a broad based concept? Sure. Well, um, first of all, thanks for asking me those questions because I, I really love talking about all this. And I'll start really, um, <laughs> I'll start really with something you mentioned earlier, which is media psychology. And a lot of people scratch their heads wondering what that is, but it's really the study of human behavior in relations to media. And I found that a really interesting idea and topic. So, um, as a former film and video producer. I saw media really changing when my children were younger, so I went back to school and got a master's in something called media psychology and social change. And while I was there, really what I noticed is there's all this great research happening in the um, realm of digital literacy, but it wasn't getting to the people who needed it most, which were parents and teachers. So myself and another uh, student decided to start CyberWise, which um, was basically a place where we could use our entertainment background to talk to parents and teachers about this new digital realm that their kids were entering in. And we decided to call it CyberWise, and we liked the motto, No Grown-Up Left Behind, (laughs) because we felt like that was very apropos. So many grown-ups were um, being left behind. So that's a little bit of the background of CyberWise. And as you mentioned, We really focus on this concept of digital citizenship, which is the safe and responsible use of digital tools. And and that's really foundational to everything that we all do online. And um, a lot of other concepts and topics grow out of that, but that's really the bedrock of what we provide both to CyberWise and CyberCivics. I see. And I was reading, you said that your your, your daughter's eighth grade class had a social media incident that sort of brought this to the fore. Could you talk to that story? Well, ironically, as I was uh, graduating out of the program and I had a paper published about digital literacy, you know, it was all very academic. And um, literally that same week, my eighth grade daughter um, in her class, the the kids at the time were really into Facebook because that was pre-Snapchat and pre-Instagram and all that. And um, uh, it was so lightweight now looking back at it. But when you're an eighth grader, it didn't feel that way. But there was a girl in the class that posted kind of every day pictures of herself and her friends, but she carefully picked pictures in which she looked really good and her friends mm. every time looked terrible. You know, and To an eighth grade girl, that's a big deal. And, and my daughter was not really the kind of kid that cared about this so much, but there was a girl in the class that this really bothered. And so this girl was a vlogger. She kept a video log online. And in one of these videos, she claimed, she was, oh, it just makes me so mad. I really want to kill that girl. And, of course, the parents saw that without full context. And went to the school administrator and reported it as cyberbullying, and he's trying to put, piece all the pictures together. And, and literally spent a week with crying girls in and out of his office and irate parents, and it was just eating all this administrative time. And I watched it, thinking, "Wow, you know, we should try to preempt these issues." And so, I volunteered at the time to teach digital literacy to the sixth graders, and he said, "Yes, can you start tomorrow?" You know, and um. Mm-hmm. We had a block that was called Civics that we turned into Cyber Civics, and that's really how our program was born. 
I think it, it, that really speaks to the sensitivity that people need to bring to the choices and uh, the, uh, how they express themselves online because right. of the broad-based nature of the audience that's going to see it. And without, as you said, complete context, uh, you have to take that seriously. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's a very uh, minor example of the really hurtful things and dangerous things that happen online. Um, you know, but to a child, even something minor can feel very hurtful. And, you know, to a kid who's sensitive, I mean, that's why we see incidences of kids, you know, sadly taking their lives and that kind of thing right. from cyberbullying. So it's an important issue for parents and teachers to get on top of. I can see that. I mean, you, you, you wrote that uh, media literary, uh, literacy experts agree that the most important skills are social and behavioral skills that are outside of technology, and you could almost see that if you were going to choose pictures of yourself with your friends to share around a table, for instance. Right. You might be much more uh, aware of picking things that were flattering to everybody because of that, uh, you know, the, 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 the technology puts that, that secondary layer in place where people might behave in ways that they might not in an actual phys physical social setting. Right, and that's something, honestly, that keeps me up at night. You know, we have so many really young kids spending a ton of time, you know, behind a screen. I mean, the latest statistics are tweens, kids between 10 and 12, spend six hours a day behind a screen, and teenagers, it's nine hours a day. And, you know, these are hours that they're not developing the social behavioral skills that will guide them in the digital world. I mean, those years of development when we play outside with our friends and we see a person's face, what it looks like when you say something mean to them or all that stuff is just the bedrock of, you know, being human and have, being empathetic and all well that. Said. Well said. And we need those skills more than ever today. I am, on your site, you write that uh, cyber civics, uh, a digital citizenship and literacy curriculum for middle school, is a turnkey in-class program that meets an urgent demand to equip students with essential digital life skills, kind of the things we're, we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Could you, Diana, explain the fundamental concepts of your curriculum uh, and the essential skills that they bring to today's students? Sure. Well, what I discovered when I started teaching this to kids is that digital citizenship cannot be taught in a one-hour assembly or a one-hour lesson. It is a very complex topic. Um, and so with the children, we are very thoughtful about starting in sixth grade when they've developed the uh, ethical thinking skills to be able to think through the scenarios that could happen online. So we spent a lot of time in that first year talking about what it means to be a citizen, not really online at all, but just a citizen of the globe <laughs> or of your community or of your classroom. And then how, how do you take those skills in a place that doesn't have social norms or laws? And then we help them understand their digital reputation and the privacy that they should be taking care of online and the impact of you know trying to get a job or going to college when you have unpleasant things on your digital reputation and how to show yourself online via a selfie. And there's a lot of topics that we cover, cyberbullying, digital drama, all that's covered in sixth grade. And what we discovered is that once we'd given children this very strong foundation is okay, well, let's build on that skill. Let's teach them now how to use the Internet as a terrific resource and information source. And so the second year, seventh grade, is all about information literacy, which is learning how to do research online and how to use search engines and what is Wikipedia and how to get personal information to get the results that you want. Again, a very rich copyright, fair use, all of that. And then our final and third year is called Media Literacy for Positive Participation, which is really helping kids evaluate media messages. This is where we get into fake news and all that. And then learning how to be a positive contributor to the online world, which is super important because we don't want kids to just be these bystanders that get caught in you know, just reading the same old thing every day. We want them to contribute in a positive way because we need them. <laughs> Adults haven't done a very good job in this realm, so I'm hoping that we can do better with the next generation. So, uh, would you? Would just a great thought. And uh, uh, would you? Would you say that there is a, a a stark contrast between, say, digital facility and digital literacy? Oh, by all means. I mean you know, put a child alone with an iPhone for three minutes and they'll have it mastered. So learning how to push the buttons, I mean, it's innate in these kids. That's not where they need our help. And frankly, they know more than any of us do, and they, we need our help in that realm. But they do need our wisdom and our lived experience 
to know how to act as a human online. And that's really important because that's something that's taught over a lifetime. I mean, it's the golden rules we learned as children. And now, you know, I mean, we learn those rules so that we'd be nice in our neighborhood. I mean, our kids, their neighborhood is the world. So they need these rules more than ever. Well said. I, I would imagine that sometimes students actually bring home the lessons from your program, Cyber Civics, and actually educate their parents uh, yeah. about these, these issues. Well, it's funny because it's actually how CyberWise started because I was I actually t started teaching cyber civics before CyberWise started, and um, one of the kids on the way out to the classroom said, Mrs. Graber, you really need to teach these lessons to my mom. <laughs> so that, that was what it got it started. But, you know, one of the things we've done in cyber civics is within – the course, it's all it's available to schools online, but within the program, there are letters that are sent home. They're pre-written, but they're uh, sent home letters to parents that give them an activity to do every week that aligns with the lesson that the child learned in school. And our hope is that by doing these activities together at home, you're right, the kids can impart some of this wisdom onto their parents and vice versa, um, because we really need parents to be engaged in this whole whole realm. Mm -hmm. So it encourages dialogue as well. Yes. That's great. Yeah. That's and it gives them tangible things to do, which I think is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. You think, do you, do you find kids in, in your estimation are frustrated by their parents' lack of expertise? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so funny to me because, especially with the sixth graders, you know, they're just starting to go online and join social networks. And a lot of the kids will tell me, gosh, I wish my mom, you know, knew what I was doing or she paid attention. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's this little tiny window that happens when they first start going on, and that window closes pretty fast. So I always tell parents, you know, take advantage of that. You know, this is a time your kid lives more than half their life online, so why would you not want to be part of that life? You know, it's they want you there at that time, and again, that window will close, but you're in, so you might as well take the opportunity to get a step in the door. It's, 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 I think it's, it's, it's significant how critically short that window is open I know. to parents to get in. I mean, if you miss it, you're it out. doesn't seem to be hardly any, uh, it would be a rare person that could catch up effectively, I would think. A rare Very person. true. Yeah, yeah, you got to stay with them every step of the way. In one of your blog posts uh, for CPI, and thank you for writing those, I will, oh, I will sure. highlight this, these in, our, uh, in the copy for our uh, interview, you, you ask whether the Internet is getting worse for our kids. Uh, and uh, first of all, kind of what do you mean by worse for our kids? And secondly, is it? Well, <laughs> I'm going to ask you what you think. Um, you know... I think that adults have been a, done a pretty good job of being digital role models. And, you know, I think that our communication um, online that we read today has really devolved to be uncivil and, and sometimes outright mean and cruel. And I think that, you know, at the top, I mean, regardless of what side of the aisle you stand on, in the top <laughs> office of the land, we see examples of social media language that's mean. You know, downright mean. Indeed. Indeed. Um, it's not grammatically correct. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> it's cruel. It's and um, you know, you don't have to be a Democrat or a Republican to believe that this is really not the best thing for children to aspire to. I mean, I want our children to learn how to be civil and have discourse and learn from one another and be kind. You know, I don't mm -hmm. think that there's many parents that I know that don't want the same for their children. So um, I think we have a lot of cleaning up to do, and I'm really hoping that the next generation can do it better. You know, I really appreciate your message here because I think speaking, uh, not naming names, but being uh, uh, digitally comprehensible is not the same as being digitally literate, I right. think. And, and, and there's right. a big difference there. I mean, when you use it as, for instance, a bully pulpit, and, yeah. and your messages are not even grammatically correct or they are, uh, you know, lacking uh, a fundamental sort of uh, uh, vetting, yeah. uh, that that doesn't speak to what my idea of literacy is. Right. And it, it's hard because, you know, on one hand, we tell um, kids how important their digital reputation is because everything they put online will be online forever and people will find it and judge them by their, their – judge their character by what they put online – and so even composing a tweet or writing a text, all of that is permanent. So I, I really try to get across to the kids, you know, 
sleep on it or think about what you're going to write or think about the per- the person on the receiving end before you put anything online because it will reflect back poorly upon you. And that's a really important lesson. And, you know, do they have adult role models to look up to? <laughs> you know, that's a question I ask myself. It's a very, very hard to teach this to kids these days when they don't see that represented by the adults that they look up to. You know, I, it seems almost as if the lowest common denominator form of trolling or lurking or some of the negativity we see in threads, for instance, on YouTube, would be an example of how the Internet is, is getting worse and, and, and it's almost scripting them, that dialogue between uh, credible uh, speakers can include these kind of diatribes and attacks. That, uh, it's a, it's, it's a, it seems to me a disturbing trend. Yeah, and, and um, you know, I don't want to be all doom and gloom because there's a lot of lovely stuff online as well. Right. I mean, I see a lot of kids doing super positive stuff. There's a lot of uplifting things. I mean, I would I would say on my own social media, probably because I'm very careful about who I decide to follow, mm-hmm. is, is stuff that's positive and uplifting, and, and I think that we can create that kind of realm online if we want to. Um, but I think, you know, it's important that we do this work with kids when they first start start going online so they can understand how to create the environment that they want to be part of. Mm-hmm. This leads to my next question, because in your blog post for CPI, you cite examples uh, from authorities like the New York Times who say that it's commonplace for kids and adults to have to sort of negotiate this trough of violent and really unsavory content to get to content, as you said, that has real meaning, value, and, and even beauty. Mm-hmm. And how do we guide young people toward this positive and productive content and technology use? Well, I mean, that's exactly why I think um, with our program we take three years to do it because this is not something that you can impart upon a child in one lesson. Mm -hmm. And so I I kind of – I put a lot of responsibility on their shoulders to think about what kind of digital world they want to create for themselves Mm -hmm. because we have to remember, you know, it's their world, largely. I mean, they're, it's devoid of adult role models. And a lot of places where the kids hang out, you know, Instagram, Snapchat, there's not adults. So they're creating their own social norms. So I, I put it on the kid's shoulder to say, look at what kind of social norms do you want in this world? And you're the guys that are going to create them. So let's talk about it and create it together. And, and you know, largely kids want to have you know, be surrounded by kids they like. They don't, no one wants to get bullied. No one wants to be mean. Right. And there's mechanisms that they can do to make that happen. And so we talk a lot about what it means to be an upstander. If you see something cruel online, what can you do? You know, you can block the person. You can report the person. You can stand up for the person. You can support the person who's being targeted. There's a lot of um, powerful acts that you can take online to help eliminate the trolling and kids need to learn what those acts are. Now, at what point in your cyber civics curriculum would an issue like that appear? Well, I mean, it starts at the very beginning. I mean, uh-huh. again, it's embedded throughout the three years, but we d- we do a whole block on cyberbullying where we we do scenarios on what you can do to be an upstander is what we call it. Mm-hmm. And they have they get strategies that they can implement online and, and learn them and get tested on them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the kids like it because, you know, an- another big thing we talk about is sexting. And, you know, a lot of people don't even bring that topic up. And Kids need to know what they can do. They just need strategies so that these things don't come back to bite them. You know, beyond the uh, the exposure because of the permanence of, of a posting, how do we speak to an issue as sensitive as sexting to students in middle school? Well, you know, the way I do it is I bring in examples of kids not not much older than themselves and what has happened to those who have been involved in a sexting incident. I mean, it's important for kids to know what a sext is, that it's a visual or written sexual image. And likewise, it's important for them to know that it's a very serious thing, that if they get caught sexting, that is either sending and or receiving. A lot of kids don't know that being on the receiving end is just as... uh, troublesome is being on the sending end and what could possibly happen. In every state, it's different, but in many states, they tr- you're treated like a child pornographer. Like you, well, you're treated as an accomplice to the act. Then, or... Right, and in some cases, up to 200 kids in a school have been suspended for it. Wow. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I, I bring into the classroom an example of one of these incidences, 
and show them, you know, the news article and the video, and I put it in their lap and say, what do you think about this? And do you think this is fair? And largely they don't. Well, how do you think you're going to keep this from happening to yourself in high school? And, you know, they talk about it amongst themselves and kind of decide, well, come to the conclusion that, you know, some of the ways to avoid this from happening is to know to have the education, number one. But number two, you know, be careful who your friends are online. That's number two. And number three, if you are involved in this incident, to know what to do so that you're not the kid that's going to be suspended. Mm-hmm. Boy, you know, when I hear about it, when I hear you talk about it, it's almost hard not to think about uh, this this great facility, this great access that technology gives us as being this sort of really low slung engine of progress that it seeks the the, the most base in human nature because that tends to grab the most attention and privately profit profitability wise it's also probably leading the pack as well I mean it's it truly is a, a, a an obstacle to confront with real gravity um, just a person well, yeah I mean I, I Many days I think that too, but, you know, I I feel lucky to be around so many middle school kids because I tell you, you know, given the chance, I mean, a lot of them want to do really great things online. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to create positive apps and they want to help each other and they want to have dialogue. And I think that given the tools to do this and the reason to do it Mm -hmm. and seeing the upside of this, I don't think it's too late. I think we can make some changes, but it's going to take a lot of work, and we we have to carve out time in our educational system to talk about kids about with kids about these issues. I mean, they spend more time on the on with their screens than they, than they do in school or with their families. Yes, I think so. The see fact, your paper, yeah. Mm-hmm. So the fact that we're not educating them how to be digital citizens or to have life skills mm-hmm. in this realm is just nuts to me. Mm-hmm. So. The, so cyber civics is a real counterbalance to that other side. I mean, it really in emphasizing the positive and and uh, in, you know incredibly the, the reach of a positive message uh, and a new me- uh, uh, say a new content that that is celebratory or or innovative. Uh, I mean, to stress that 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 a- that access to that technology will create this you know this posit- this to will promote their own positive idea and the. And, the, and their own uniquely positive character has got to be a very potent motivator for students. Right, and, and, you know, they have to because more and more college recruiters are looking at their digital reputation, so they, you know, there's a great incentive there to be nice and positive online, right? <laughs> right, uh, indeed. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit here towards... Uh, Something that's been in the news lately. There was a recent Stanford study about the prevalence of fake news. Certainly, uh, a t- uh, very prevalent in the news these days because of our political environment. A- a- and the Stanford study found that a majority of of kids, uh, middle schoolers included, uh, I mean, kids that should have some developed sense of judgment, in fact, can't distinguish fake news from legitimate reporting. And I- I'm wondering how how can parents help their kids evaluate the legitimacy of online content. Well, I mean, this is a really great argument for media literacy um, in school because right now, you know, that's where we're getting our information largely is from the Internet, and we need to be taught how to read it just like we were taught how to read a book. And so, um, you know, it's something that that we do quite a lot in cyber civics, and one of the lessons I really love is actually I got it from Howard... um, Reingold, who's a Stanford professor who came up with this acronym called CRAP Detection, and it, I think a lot of people have heard of that, but for those who haven't, <laughs> um, it's a, you know, when the kids come in the classroom, I write CRAP on the board, and they're like, oh my gosh, Mrs. Graber, what are we learning about today? And I'm like, this is what you're learning. <laughs> and so I got I got their attention, right? right. And so CRAP is actually um, stands for a, a way to, to recognize CRAP online. And the C stands for current, how current is your information. The R is for how reliable or does there have references. Uh, the A is for who's the author. Is it like a real person with degrees or is it just somebody in their bedroom in Milwaukee? And then the P is for purpose or the point of view. Is the person, do they have an ax to grind or is it really a level story? So really using those four things, it's very handy to be able to evaluate a news article or a website to determine its veracity. I use it myself when I'm going through Facebook and people have posted articles. I, I don't read the article until I've given it the crap detection test. And so <laughs> I really good. don't. And so I, I've 
you know, that's what we do in the classroom with the students. And it's something they'll never forget, and it's very handy. And, you know, you ask what parents can do, and, I mean, th maybe teach them this test, talk to them about clickbait. You know, what is clickbait? I bet a lot of parents don't know what that is, but right. it's when a headline is written in a way to grab a bunch of readers, and maybe it doesn't even relate to what the story is about. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a whole new world of literacy out there that we need to be addressing and teaching to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, and, and it can even be with the prevalence of, of now what's called native advertising, which is which appears to be, uh, you know, content that has been vetted by uh, a, a, a incredible source that is in fact placed as an yeah. ad. Uh, yeah. I, I, I like to think that the, the people that are selling that sort of space are vetting their content uh, pretty rigorously. I yeah, and, I, and that's the other thing is, you know, I teach the kids about how that happens, and we just did a lesson last week about, you know, it's the beginning of understanding that, you know, every time you give a website personal information, in return, you're getting customized information, but you're also creating this filter bubble where you're just giving yourself back things you already like or know. And for kids to understand how that happens is very important, so if they don't like it, they can change it. And just knowing what cookies are, a lot of adults don't understand that when you visit a website, it drops a cookie on your computer so it remembers your personal information. And kids love knowing that stuff because then they can make a choice. That's an excellent point. I mean, it's amazing and how 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 fast these cookies and how how, how really, from a marketing sense, how directed they really are towards. I mean, it, it can almost seem like, uh, you know, this sort of intuitive magic where an ad appears, I mean, for maybe you were interested in, in uh, a watch, uh, and, you know, two weeks later, uh, on a page that's completely unrelated, appears a banner ad for, right. for a it's watch. Right, it's crazy. And you yeah. say, wow, I mean, somebody, there's there's some great expertise behind Oh yeah. yeah. Behind that sort of data mining going yeah, on. Yeah, and why wouldn't we teach kids how that happens so they know? Good point. I mean, you you, yeah. you, that really, you led into one of the things you said earlier about the bubble leads into my next uh, question about the social media phenomenon known as the spiraling feedback loop mm -hmm. and why it's exhausting and misleading and why it can reinforce and uh, spiral the same interests and regurgitate the interest that the child is is pursuing online. Right. Can you speak to right. that a little bit? Well, you know, that's that's what I was explaining when we, in information literacy, which is the second year of cyber civics, we do a whole block on personal information to get them to understand this concept about, you know, the Internet collects your personal information to give you back a customized experience. And in some ways that's great when Amazon tells us what books th it thinks we like. But in some ways, especially when you're a young person and you're trying to get knowledge, it really limits the knowledge you get. And so uh, it was really funny because I, I had a real tough class on Friday, and uh, they're really, you know, it's hard to get their attention. But I told them that the school principal had hired a research company to come in and to follow them around for a week and to write down everything they do and everything they eat and oh everyone they God. talk to. And the kids were so angry. And so I said, oh, you know, write me a paragraph telling me why you think this is bad. And so we t went through that whole process. And of course, they're like, you know, it's creepy and they're stalking me and th it's my personal information and blah, blah, blah. So at the end, you know, I tell the kids, well, you know, this is what happens every time you go online. And they were like, whoa. <laughs> what, a, what a great sort of lesson. And it. it's like, hey, just because the person is there and I've notified you that they're going to be here in flesh and blood. It, that's just yeah. that's just the, it's almost like the person has become the metaphor for the technology yeah. that is tracking the same thing. It it kind of blew their minds, and you know, then I had to teach them the vocabulary words, you know, third party, uh, mm -hmm. personally identifiable information, cookies, and it, what would normally be a very boring assignment, they were totally into. So almost you know, they like care. Pulling back the Oz curtain and seeing yeah. you know, how it's manipulated by yeah. someone with. Uh, with skill and with an agenda. Right. They deserve to know this stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, their parents deserve to know. Mm -hmm. in, in one of your uh, blogs for CPI called Is the Internet Getting Worse for Our Kids, you include the wish, my, my digital wish, uh, is to humanize social media. Let's create the environment we'd like to live in. Uh, and, and even though a lot of the digital landscape leaves people sort of gasping for breath uh, of fresh air uh, because of some of the unsavory content, 
uh, isn't what we've created necessarily what in a greater cultural sense what we've asked for Oh, forgive it. Are you asking if we're just getting back the what we're seeing a reflection of ourselves? <laughs> well, uh, you know, kind of. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. I mean, is I just wondered if you had a person because you're so close to it. I mean. Yeah. Is uh, I mean, I guess this is a tougher philosophical question, but I'm interested in your thought on it. Well, it depends on whose voice is louder, you know, and, and that's where I like to tell kids and to remind adults that, you know. We have power. I mean, if there's something that we don't like, you can block it. You can report it. If someone's being mean to someone, you can support the person who's being, you know, targeted. And it happens a lot. Um, if someone's being a troll, report the troll. You know, don't don't like what they do. Don't even read what they do. I mean, right. trolls will go away if they don't have an audience. They're just a bully looking for someone to bully. You know, sure. and so it's really like taking the power back. You know, and I, and I don't even want to say that it's a level playing field because, as I mentioned before, I think there's a lot of lovely people and lovely things online. Um, we just need to give them louder voices and more likes. <laughs> Do you, would you say that cyber civics in its curriculum is based on a fundamental optimism about the power of uh, online technology? Definitely. I mean, it's it's all about, you know, my ultimate goal after the three-year program, I always tell the kids, like, be like Superman, use your online powers for good, and create networks of people that are, inspire you and that you inspire them, and stand up for others, and use your voice to make the world better. I mean, wow, what kid isn't inspired with that power, you know? Uh, that's great. I mean, empowering them to share the good and the, and the productive ideas that... Right. Is, and again, as I mentioned, they have a powerful incentive to do that because it goes towards their digital reputation, which they're just forming, which is very important to their future. Do you speak to, to digital rep, rep, uh, reputation and how that becomes, uh, uh, how a profile builds in, in cyber civics? I mean, is that a point that you stress, especially uh, with a particular emphasis? Oh yeah, and, and we just we do that in sixth grade um, in a whole block. And I just did that lesson with some sixth graders last Friday. And the way we do it is that um, we pretend like we're going to hire a couple candidates to work at their school. Mm -hmm. And so we look at their very nice cover letters. And then in order to determine who to hire, the kids take a look at their digital background. And you know this is all fake, of course. But they don't. <laughs> a lot of times the kids are so into the activity they pretend that it's all pretend. Um, or they forget that it's all pretend, but we take a look at their Facebook page and Instagram posts and news articles, and they compare these two candidates to decide who it is they want to hire based on their digital background. So it puts oh. the kids in the driver's seat. It's really fun. They they enjoy it a lot, but it puts them in the driver's seat as an employer. You know, how would they make the decision? And in almost every case, when I've done this lesson with the kids, they're like, oh, I don't want to hire either person because that little thing appeared five years ago in their digital background, you know. What a great way to underscore the, uh, I mean, to put them in that decision maker yeah. seat and to say, here's what you're given to go on. Right. How do you, how do you make the most informed decision? Can you trust yeah. what you see? I mean, yeah. Hmm. Hey, I, I, have you just uh, out of curiosity in this recent news out of Chicago and that Facebook, uh, incident in Chicago. Has that come up in your in your classroom? Um, which Facebook? I don't know that I'm well, familiar there was, with Well, there was a, a person with a disability who was abused for Oh, a long God, time. yeah. Yeah, I mean... That I, was horrible. Yeah. Um, I did not bring that up because of the age of the kids. I see. Um, I probably could have with the eighth graders, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the sixth, I wouldn't. I see. Yeah, they see enough negativity as it is. I, I but just, yeah, that was horrible. I, I'm just it, clearly, I'm just thinking as a as someone teaching cyber civics and to show off the 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 negative potency yeah. of something like a face a live Facebook feed. I mean, that, yeah. I mean, if that doesn't underscore the timeliness of understanding or getting this curriculum into schools, then yeah, uh, I mean, then I don't know what quite would be as stark an example that we need that. You uh, know, it's it's like there's examples every day, and 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 that's why. I mean, it's crazy to me that every school isn't making this a priority because, again, when things like that happen, it's so easy to preempt, you know, with a little bit of 
effort on our part as adults to make time to teach kids about this powerful tool that we put in their hands, often way too young. You have on your website, CyberWise, a free download that might speak to exactly this, A Parent's Guide to Digital Literacy. Could you talk right. about the contents of that resource? And, and it seems especially pertinent at this point in our discussion, and, and talk about how it would be useful to parents. Right. Well, we have a couple freebies. Um, when parents go to CyberWise, which is cyberwise.org, and sign up for our newsletter, uh, they immediately get um, the Parent's Guide to Digital Literacy, and, and it really covers all the basics of how to be a digital parent and what kids need to know, what they need from us. It's, it's real handy. And then when someone goes to the CyberCivics website, which is cybercivics.com, um, we give away a couple free lessons that parents or teachers can do with their students to kind of give them an idea of the kind of lessons that we do in the classroom. Oh, excellent. excellent. Yeah. Well, we'll be sure that will be... We'll be sure and highlight those links uh, on the oh, printing great. page for the podcast. Um, I have a, a, a last question here that uh, I took from uh, your paper, your journal article, rather, uh, New Media Literacy Education, uh, a Developmental Approach, that you wrote for the National Association for Media Literacy's Education's Journal of Media Literacy Education, I think. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Lots of mouthful. words there, huh? That's a, lot of, that's a mouthful <laughs> indeed. But the thought is is really... A lot simpler, and you, you write, ethical thinking is the skill du jour. I, I, I explain that. It's a, it's a really provocative sentence. <laughs> well, it's it's something that I really I touch on quite a bit when I, I talk to a lot of parent groups at schools. And, you know, what I always tell parents is I think a lot of these problems that we see online would disappear if we simply respected age limits on social media networks. And there's a big reason for that. You know, number one, it's a law. There's a law called COPA, which is the Child Online Privacy Protection Act, which protects children under 13 from advertisers. And so you have to be 13 to use most social networks. But number two is, you know, it's a developmental thing. I mean, it takes children up to 13 years of life to develop the cognitive capacities to do abstract thinking, and abstract thinking is the prerequisite to ethical thinking. So these mistakes kids make, being mean, uploading stupid pictures, you know, passing around things they shouldn't, a lot of that stuff happens because they're too young to understand the implications of their actions. And so I'm always surprised and perplexed when parents will give, you know, a nine-year-old a cell phone with unlimited access, and then they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe my daughter did that or my son did that. And, you know, it's not the child's fault because they really don't have that brain power to think ethically. And when you think about it, everything we do online almost requires ethical thought. You know, do I upload a photo that's unflattering to my friend? Do I download music I don't have the rights to? Do I plagiarize? Do I copy and paste? All of that's ethical thought, and it really takes children a while, a long while, to develop the capacity to be good ethical thinkers. And now they have so much more uh, uh, latitude and access to break those eth ethical boundaries that they perhaps have not been educated Oh, about yeah, yet. totally. And then when they break them, it comes back to bite them years later, you know, because you know, it never goes yeah. away. Mm -hmm. And that's a message I think parents would do well to understand as a key component of digital literacy. Right. Is that, is that taught? And, and, and also, I mean, the, the uh, just to really champion that for a second. I mean, the, to take that ethical thinking into your day-to-day -day, uh, living with people that are around you, I mean, how much better you will be informed when the actual human being, the breathe and the social situation that includes living, breathing uh, people, uh, I mean, the urgency and the applicability of it will be, seems to be will seem to be more apparent to the kids after they've had this sort of education and ethical thinking. Right. It makes me think of a, a young man that graduated last year out of eighth grade, and um, I had him talking to some teachers about cyber civics, and he said, well, I don't feel like I was learning digital skills as much as I was just learning life skills. And I think that says it best. You know, these are life skills that kids need in a digital age, and they're indispensable. That is a terrific uh, and very concise uh, final thought, Diana. Unless there's something else you would like to leave us with? 
No, I, I mean, it's great, and I think the work that you guys do is so important, and I'm very honored to have, to blog for you, so thank you. Oh, we're, we're very grateful to have you today. My guest today has been uh, Diana Graver. She is a recognized expert on digital literacy, and you can find links to her site, Cyber Civics and CyberWise. Thank you, Diana. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. And thank you. You're welcome, and thank you all for listening. Thank you for joining us today on Unrestrained. Tune in again soon for another interview with an expert in behavior management. Until then, this is your host, Terry Vitone, hoping your intention is prevention.